So in this book, I make several claims. Let me start with the first one. In the very first sentence of the book, I make a, a large claim. The claim is that the specter of the sellout, that is to say the, the, the fear of abandonment, the fear of betrayal, is a central anxiety in black American life. That's, that's what I say in the very first sentence of this book. Well, that's a, that's a big claim. And uh, it's a claim that demands substantiation. And it's a claim that I try to substantiate by giving lots of examples, lots of examples of people who have either uh, uh, called other people sellouts and uh, examples of people who have been the target of the sellout indictment. And as I was doing research, I tried to focus on people who I thought would, in a sense, shock the reader, people who would be well-known people, and it would be a surprise for a reader to learn that such a person had been called a sellout. So let me give you a couple of examples. In the 19th century, probably the most celebrated black activist intellectual in America was probably Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist. Well, on the occasion of Frederick Douglass's second marriage, he was deemed by a substantial number of black Americans to have abandoned the race, betrayed blackness. Why? because uh, Frederick Douglass's second wife was a white woman. Frederick Douglass's first wife was a black woman who had helped him to escape slavery. They had a long marriage. They had several children together. She died. And after a couple of years passed, he remarried. And when he remarried a white woman, there were a substantial number of black people who were just through with Frederick Douglass and accused him of engaging in racial betrayal. Let's go forward to the 20th century. The most celebrated black activist intellectual in the 20th century, at least a good argument could be made that the most celebrated was W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the great founders of the NAACP. In 1917, in the pages of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a, uh, an article, a very short article, an editorial, one paragraph long, but it packed quite a punch. It was, an, it was an editorial entitled Closing Ranks. And in this editorial, W.E.B. Du Bois urged black Americans to rally around the flag. America had entered World War I. And W.E.B. Du Bois said that a black American should rally around the flag and support the American war effort and should also subordinate their protests, their just protests, against white supremacist policies in the United States. Well, there were colleagues of Du Bois's in the, in the NAACP and elsewhere who were just absolutely appalled. Absolutely appalled. I think of Monroe Trotter. I think of Archibald Grimke. They were just totally, they were angry with Du Bois. And they called him what? They called him a black Benedict Arnold who had betrayed the race. In today's lingo, he would undoubtedly have been called a sellout. Let me go to our own time. In our own time, the person whose name has become virtually synonymous with racial betrayal is Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Thomas has been called a sellout hundreds of times. I mean, truly, I mean, to, to, to pull a Clarence Thomas <laughs> is to engage in racial betrayal. And there are a variety of reasons why people have uh, pinned this uh, label on to Clarence Thomas, but probably the most 
the most prominent reason, the most important, and the, the one that has earned him the, the most uh, revilement is his uh, vociferous denunciations of affirmative action. But he's been called a sellout many, many, many times. Let me mention another figure who hasn't been called a sellout, but there have been, there have been suspicions raised. People have, have, have raised a question about his racial loyalty. And that person is a person who really at this moment is one of the most prominent people in all of America. I'm thinking of Barack Obama. I mean, Barack Obama, through the course of his historic campaign for the presidency, has had to face sort of lingering questions about his racial identity. In his case, what's the, what, what prompts these questions? What prompts these questions is the fact that he is embraced by substantial numbers of white people. Substantial numbers of white people have embraced Barack Obama and embraced him fervently. And that has triggered the following response in some precincts within the black community. The white people like this guy. Why do the, why do the white folks like this Negro so much? I mean, is, is he selling out? And he has actually addressed this. He addressed this very forthrightly in a speech to the National Association of Black Journalists in which he talked about the way in which uh, black elected officials are burdened with this problem uh, whereby if they, if they receive substantial white support, it generates a a response in some black circles which it's a, it's a pall of suspicion that's placed over their heads. I could give other examples but I hope that those give at least some texture to the my claim that uh, fear of abandonment, fear of uh, betrayal is a central anxiety in black American life. In fact, in the book, I make the claim that practically every successful black person, especially those working or studying in a predominantly white environment, can expect at some time or another to be met with the insinuation that they are a sellout. The um, second point. Second point. Second point I make is that this anxiety is uh, perfectly understandable. In fact, this anxiety is an unavoidable feature of group life. Every group, within every group, there is this anxiety. I don't care if we're talking about an organized crime family. I don't care if we're talking about a union. I don't care if we're talking about a school. I don't care if we're talking about a nation state. Think about the United States of America. The United States of America, as powerful as it is, periodically undergoes meltdowns in which there's hysteria about internal subversion or people engaged in treason. And this isn't just something that happens periodically. This is something that actually that's, that happens on a consistent basis. After all, we do have an internal revenue service. What's the internal revenue service about? The internal revenue service is an agency that polices uh, citizens to make sure that they uh, contribute to the upkeep of the polity. And if you don't contribute to the upkeep of the polity by paying your taxes, you are deemed to be a criminal. Just like in the black community, if you, don't, if you are deemed to default on your racial dues, you are deemed to be a sellout. 
or the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice, the, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation spends a lot of time seeking to ferret out people who may be engaged in treasonous behavior. And in you know, black circles, there is a considerable amount of monitoring to make sure that uh, one's allegiances go to blackness. Uh, and if there is a suspicion that one is insufficiently loyal, then one must face the sellout indictment. So every group faces this, and it's understandable. I mean, it's very difficult to keep a group together. And uh, any group that calls, a, as soon as you create a group, as soon as you give a group a title, you immediately create a boundary. There's the, the group, whatever its name is, and then there are people outside of the group. And every group has boundaries, and every group creates rules which say that if you go to a certain point beyond those boundaries, you are outside of the, you are beyond the pale. You are a traitor. So this is an inescapable part of, um, of group life. At least that's my claim. Now, not all group ostracism is bad. Some ostracism within the group, some coercion within the group is very good. I mean, to engage in collective action requires a certain amount of coercion. When a union goes out on strike, not, every, not everybody wants to go out on strike. In order to keep people in line to effectuate the desires of the whole, you ostracize those who don't go on strike when they're told to. They become what? Scabs. And within black America, there is a similar phenomenon. And again, this just comes with group existence. Inescapable, unavoidable. But of course, even though it's unavoidable, it can have very bad consequences if it's not disciplined. And one of the things that I try to show in my book is that this this the tendency to indict people for being a sellout can have very bad consequences. It can uh, truncate debate. It can make people so afraid of being called a sellout that they shut themselves up, they censor themselves. Uh, and in doing so, they um, lead to the impoverishment of discussion. The impoverishment of discussion leads to a lack of sharpness in thinking. I mean, we've, black community, like all communities, faces real dilemmas, real difficulties. And how is it that we are able to think our way through difficulties? We're only able to think our way through difficulties through conversation, through debate, through contentiousness, learning from one another in the grip of conflict. And so if people shut themselves up for fear of being ostracized, if that happens too much, then certain issues are not discussed, certain points of view are not put forward, and the group is the worse off for that. There's another thing that happens with uh, uh, this, with the, with the problem of um, sell out indictment, and that is the problem of making, making people into enemies. You know, if I'm in a debate with you about some subject, we may be able to, we may find that we disagree about something. Maybe we disagree very sharply, I mean, we're really at loggerheads, but, you know, people can be at loggerheads and then after a certain point of time, they decide that, you know, okay, let's, let's stop talking about this and let's share a meal. And over the meal, they may discover that they agree about a lot of things. You know, they may have disagreed about something for hours and hours and hours, but then over a meal, they discover that they agree about this, they agree about this, they agree about the other. And in their agreement, maybe they find that they can be allies. 
But just suppose that in the grip of their disagreement, one of them, one of these antagonists has called the other a sellout. If that happens, I don't think there is going to be a discussion over dinner. When that happens, when somebody is called a sellout, they cease to become, they cease to be mere ideological opponents. They become enemies. And when people are enemies, they don't eat meals together, and they probably don't talk together. Because even, it takes a certain amount of trust even to disagree with somebody. If you're enemies, you are going to treat the other as an enemy. And you are going to be alienated, maybe on a permanent basis. And for a group like black Americans that is besieged by so many difficulties, it seems to me that it's a real cost to engage in a type of rhetoric that needlessly alienates people in such a radical way. Okay. Let me say a bit about the person who is the focus of the longest chapter in my book, and that is Justice Thomas. Because I think many people would view him as something of a, of a litmus test for my, my way of approaching this subject of racial betrayal. So here's my, here's my line on Justice Thomas. I disagree very strongly with Justice Thomas about a lot of things and the things that matter most in terms of racial politics. So I disagree with Justice Thomas, for instance, about affirmative action. He thinks affirmative action is unconstitutional. I don't. He thinks affirmative action is large, is, is bad for African Americans, bad for the country, but he also thinks it's bad for African Americans and all other beneficiary groups. I don't. And I argue the position very strongly in my book. I think he's just wrong, wrong in, you know, ten different ways. At the same time, the question is, is Clarence Thomas a sellout? I don't think so. I don't think, it's, I don't think it's, he can properly be deemed uh, a sellout. Uh, is there any evidence to suggest that uh, he means ill toward black America? No. The fact of the matter is, he sees himself very much as a race man. If you read Justice Thomas's opinions, he, in, in the racial area, one of the things that he focuses on over and over and over again is, is this advancing the interests of black Americans? He's very straightforward about it. Very straightforward. He thinks that affirmative action is bad for black Americans, and that's one of the reasons why he's against it. Now, let me drop a footnote. Let me drop a footnote here. It is, it seems to me, somewhat odd or inconsistent that Justice Thomas would ask the question, is this good for black America? Because after all, he's also a justice who goes on and on and on and on about the colorblind constitution. I mean, if Justice, if, if Justice Thomas was here, I'd say, well, Justice Thomas, insofar as you believe in the colorblind constitution, why do you care if a policy is good for black America or not? It should be immaterial to you. Really. It should be immaterial to you. But it's not immaterial to him. Clearly, it matters to him. And clearly, his reputation in black America matters to him. He's very hurt by the knowledge that he is widely viewed as a sellout. He's very hurt by that. It angers him. The fact that he's hurt by it and angers him is itself evidence of his, at some level, being very much of a race man. It's not like he's saying, oh, I don't care. It does matter to him. He, 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 he does care. His anger is, in a sense, the flip side of his caringness. So he's, he's very, he's a, in my view, Justice Thomas is a extremely conservative race man. 
Now, I can imagine somebody saying, well, listen, motive shouldn't be the only thing that matters. I mean, after all, can't people engage in treason and say that they're engaging in treason for the good of those whom they're betraying? And the answer is, yeah, somebody could say that. And so let me turn to a second reason why, in my view, it's improper to call Clarence Thomas a uh, race traitor. With respect to virtually all of the issues that are uh, the subject of controversy with respect to Justice Thomas, there is a real debate to be had, including with respect to affirmative action. I'd say 10 to 15 percent of the black population, a much larger percentage of the white population, but just stick to the black population for a minute, 10 to 15 percent of black Americans agree with Justice Thomas with respect to affirmative action. I mean, it's not like he's taking some completely idiosyncratic position in which one could say, who to thunk it? You know, how can this person possibly say this? 10 to 15 percent of black Americans agree with Justice Thomas. Furthermore, Furthermore, the arguments that he advances against affirmative action, some of them anyway, are, in my view, quite weighty arguments. They're quite weighty arguments that demand a response. It can't be just dismissed. One of his arguments goes like this. Listen, why is it, he says in his opinions, why is it that all of this time and energy is spent on, on defending a policy that actually benefits uh, a sector of the black population that is actually in relatively good shape. I mean, the beneficiaries of affirmative action, for instance, in higher education are people who are going to college. The last big affirmative action case was a case involving uh, the University of Michigan Law School if you are in a position to apply to the University of Michigan Law School, you're in pretty good shape. And so Thomas says, listen, you know, what about all the black kids who don't get out of high school, who are in no position to apply to any college, much less any law school? What about them? Well, you know, that's, I think there's a response to that. I think there's a response to that, but it's not as if the question he poses is, you know, a, a, silly, a silly challenge. And he, gives, he makes other challenges as well. I mean, he talks about, you know, affirmative action being a stigmatizing policy. It's not a, it's not a frivolous point. There's a response to it. I think in certain ways it is a stigmatizing policy. But then there's always, you know, compared to what? Every policy has its costs. In my view, the costs of affirmative action are outweighed by its benefits. But you can have a good debate about that. You can have a good debate about that. I don't think that the arguments that he sets forth are so weightless, so lacking, in substance, as to indicate that a person making those arguments uh, should be viewed as, you know, just an outcast. I think they're arguments that have weight and that, frankly, a reasonable pe person could hold. Now, again, I disagree with them. I disagree with them strongly. I disagree with them profoundly, but I do not view him as a sellout. Now, at this point, I can imagine somebody in the audience saying, good grief, Kennedy. If, if Clarence Thomas isn't a sellout, who is? And I, you know, I, I think that's, a, I think that's a, a worthwhile question, and here's my response. Insofar as black America is concerned, I know of no influential figure in black America who I view as a sellout. And that includes a lot of people with whom I'm, you know, I disagree strongly.
people who, you know, are called sellout. I mean, I think of, you know, somebody like uh, I don't know, Alan Keyes. Think about the man on the West Coast, uh, Ward Connerly. Think of others. Uh, Shelby Steele, thank you. Or in some circles, this man who uh, was the head of uh, from a CEO at BET, Bob Johnson. There are a whole set of people. Disagree with in various ways, but sell out? No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't view them as, as, as meeting my criteria, criterion, to be properly viewed as, you know, a traitor. Well, let me just say one other thing, then I'll subside. Let me go autobiographical for a moment and tell you, you know, what, well, why did I write this book? There are lots of interesting subjects, there are a lot of nice, there are a lot of, you know, important topics to address. Why did I address this topic? There were two things that I think prompted me to really want to focus on this term sellout and unpack it. One is that um, I've been the target of the sellout indictment mainly because of things that I've written in the past. Uh, when I was introduced, um, mention was made of uh, two books that I've written, uh, both of which uh, uh, prompted people to call me a sellout. One was um, interracial intimacies, in which I defended, stoutly defended, uh, interracial intimacy marital intimacy or intima adoption as a type of you know, intimacy. And for taking the positions I did, there were some people who uh, called me a sellout. And then when I wrote Nigger, The Strange Career of a Troublesome Word, there were people who called me a sellout because they, you know, didn't, well, didn't like the, me the general message of the book, but took special exception at the title. So, you know, as, there was, as, as, a, as a target, of the sellout indictment, I, I suppose that's, that's one thing that, that made me attuned to it. A second thing that made me attuned to this phenomenon of uh, you know, this, this, the alacrity with which people, uh, some people accuse others of being sellout, has to do with my experience as a, as a professor uh, and my interaction with black students at my home law school, Harvard Law School. Every year I come into contact with these students, black students, very well trained, very disciplined, very talented, very admirable people. An appreciable number of whom leave Harvard Law School with a feeling of guilt and a feeling of shame. And I'll tell you how it comes out. I will have taught some of these students in their first year. I teach contracts. So I teach a lot of first year students. I'll have taught these students in their first year. And then I might not see them again until their third year when they're beginning ready to graduate. And when they're getting ready to graduate, I'll see them and I'll say, gosh, you know, Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, good seeing you. What are you, gonna, what are you doing after you leave here? And when I say that to them, they'll come, they'll, they won't just speak in a regular voice. They'll come, they'll sidle up close to me. And they'll say under their breath that they're going to work for such and such a law firm. And then they'll say very quickly, but I'm not going to be there long. I'm only doing it to pay off student loans. You know, I don't want to be a sellout. And I'll, you know, I'll say, listen, hold it. First of all, congratulations on your graduation. Congratulations on getting such a fine position. And, you know, I just want to let you know that I believe in uh, people pursuing happiness. And if you're going to be unhappy at this law firm, by all means, you know, my advice would be don't go at all. There's plenty of things you can do. On the other hand, if you think that you can pursue happiness 
by and, and, and you know and pursue your ambitions by being the managing partner of you know I don't know Crevasse Wayne and Moore or Covington and Burling or any of the great law firms here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, knock yourself out. And don't feel, you know, don't have this, I don't know, survivor's guilt. Don't be angst-ridden. Don't feel that you are paying insufficient racial dues. If you are decent and you take care of the uh, uh, responsibilities as a parent, as a sibling, as a citizen, and you go on and fulfill your responsibilities as an attorney, you will have done enough. And you should feel perfectly happy going on and doing in the world what you want to do. And I must say, after years of you know, conversations going back and forth over that, it made me think about you know, what was prompting these students to feel just so angst-ridden and so burdened. And that's, too, that experience was what prompted me to want to write this book. Well, I think I've said enough. Uh, the floor is now open for questions, for comments, and by all means for objections, because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I know full well that uh, there are a lot of people who uh, disagree with uh, the positions I've, art I've articulated and certainly positions I've written about. So the floor is open to uh, objections as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe you talk. I'm really curious. Uh, I don't have necessarily an objection to what you said, but I'm very curious. Uh, your uh, bar commissioner was a cook for 31. Yes. Okay, a couple. Yes, there were, uh, the, qu the question was, uh, what are, um, with respect to Justice Clarence Thomas, do I think that he is comfortable in his skin as a black man? And do I think that he is an opportunist? And what would have happened had he been the first black justice? Um, on the question of do I think that he's comfortable in his skin, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've met the justice on a number of occasions, but, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't know him all that well. I will respond in the following way. I think that there are, I think that there are millions of black Americans, like there are millions of, Americans of other backgrounds who uh, are like humans generally. They feel some degree of comfort and they feel some degree of discomfort. I think that he probably feels, I mean, you know, many of us are ambivalent about various aspects of ourselves, various aspects of our background. I mean, alienation and self-alienation is you know, part of the human condition. Richard Wright, one of my favorite writers, certainly felt, you know, a very complicated relationship to blackness. Ralph Ellison, another one of my favorites, felt a very complicated relationship to blackness. I think that probably, you know, does Clarence Thomas probably have a very complicated relationship to blackness? Yeah. In fact, I would think that that would probably be the more characteristic 
posture as opposed to the person who feels completely at ease. Um, Clarence Thomas as opportunist. You know, opportunist. Um, opportunist is the tendentious way of describing somebody who is ambitious. I mean, most people who want to get someplace, uh, you know, sort of try to figure out a way of getting where they want to get. So if they feel that they'll have a better shot at, you know, getting someplace by saying this or not saying something, you know, they'll act accordingly. You know, is he a very ambitious guy? Sure, you don't get to the Supreme Court by not being ambitious. I mean, you know, the, the, all of the, all, you know, I mean, Supreme Court justices, as far as I'm concerned, are lawyers who are politicians who wear robes. And to that extent, show me a uh, politician who has gotten to the higher echelons of power in America who is, you know, not an opportunist. So, I mean, in a way, I mean, I, th I think he's an ambitious person who figured out a way to get where he wanted to go. Well, yeah. I mean, if that's, if you want to call that being an opportunist, then yeah. I think there are other ways to put it. And I've already indicated, by the way, and I'll state it again, I'm extremely critical of Justice Thomas. But again, I, you know, let's be, um, Thurgood Marshall is a great man whom I revered and still do revere. Did uh, Justice Marshall take positions, say things at certain times, not say things at certain times, with an eye toward advancing his career? The answer is yes. Sure. Do I hold that against him? No. Do I thank God that he did? Yes. So that he could be in a position to do what he did, which was, you know, be one of the great progressive jurists in American history. Now, um, there was one other, there, was, there were three things. Who is, oh yes, if, well, I mean, he, you know, he, according to his own writings, you know, his thinking changed. So, I mean, there was a time when his thinking would have been very different. Uh, than it is now. And frankly, as far as I can tell, there w he, he was, his, his thinking at an earlier time in his life was, you know, more clear-eyed <laughs> than his thinking now. I think his thinking now, with respect to certain things, is terribly confused. Justice Thomas, among other things, has a very difficult time finding uh, racial discrimination when, you know, it's like right in front of them. So, you know, I disagree with them. But, um, but I'm very loath, very loath to pin the label of treason on someone. Now, when I was going through, you know, writing drafts of this book, and, you know, when you write a book, you send it around to people. Or... If you're a teacher, you have the great benefit of having captive audiences, otherwise known as classes. And so you can try your, you know, you can try your ideas out. Now, one thing I got late in the writing of the book, there were some people who, you know, I'd sort of, uh, try and out, you know, try these ideas out, and they said, "Listen, uh, Kennedy, I don't like your definition of sellout because we think it's too tight." We think it is, it is so confining that it really, it's become a straw man. It doesn't breathe. You know, nobody can fit within it. So in the book, in the book, I give examples today of people who I think can rightly be viewed as sellouts. Just to try to show that I'm willing to keep the category. It's just like I said, I don't think that there are no, there, Black Americans, I don't know of any influential black Americans who fit within it. But let me tell you some, let me give you some examples of people who would fit within it. But here I have to engage in an analogy. 
and go to a different realm of American life. And here, let me, let me go to gay America. Gay America. There are gay Americans, usually closeted, who have supported politicians and movements that are expressly anti-gay. So up in my neck of the woods in Massachusetts, there's a man, and now, I'm, frankly, his name has gone out of my mind, I mentioned him in my book, but I can't remember his name now. This is a man who was a top advisor to Senator Jesse Helms when Jesse Helms was the leading anti-gay senator in the United States Congress. This man, a gay man, in fact, he recently got married in Massachusetts. This gay man was a leading supporter and strategist for Jesse Helms. Well, he was outed by gay activists and was called a sellout. Do I object to that? No, I don't object to that. It seems to me that the, the, the category fits in that, in that instance. Terry Dolan, one of the founders of NICPAC, was a supporter of right-wing, anti-gay activists, anti-gay politicians, anti-gay forces. He was outed after he died and described as a sellout. I have no objections to that. So now you might ask, why is it that one cat there, there's, there are people in one category, but at least in my view, an absence of, 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 of figures in another. I think that, large, that doesn't have to do with, you know, the question. That, that, that has to do, in my view, with the difference between the status of anti-black, of at least expressly anti-black politics in America and expressly anti-gay politics. Fortunately, the market for expressly anti-gay politics doesn't exist. There is still, unfortunately, a thriving market for expressly anti-gay politics. So, poli so politicians will be expressly anti-gay, whereas politicians will not be expressly anti-black. And I think that largely explains the, the difference. Yes, ma'am. I would agree with you that uh, I think w one of the problems with the uh, sellout indictment is that it's, it's, uh, it tends to flatten out the black community, to make it seem much narrower, much simpler than it is. I mean, the United States of America is a huge country. We're talking, about, we're talking about millions of people. Black Americans are to be found in every, in Alaska. In, well, I mean, I think black. Two things there. One, I think that we have to be careful here. You, 
I understand your point. On the other hand, all language simplifies. So, you know, you could ask the question, you know, who is an American? Um, we use language to try to communicate things to one another. I think it's, I think when somebody says, when you, when, if, I, if I were to go to a, a town, get off a train and say to a cab driver, where is the black community in this area? Cab driver would, if there were a variety of black communities, he would say that. If there was one place where a you know, large number of people commonly thought of as black lived, he would know that. I mean, we have, to, we have to make things intelligible to one another, and so we use terms. And I think that the term black America, black, you know, black community, so long as we keep in our minds that it is a simplification, it is a simplification, but it also steers us generally to a reality that is a true reality. And I think what we need to know about that reality is black Americans come in a lot of different colors. They come from different ideological positions. They come from different religious traditions. They have all sorts of different ways of viewing the world. One of the things that people who, who deploy the sellout indictment are attempting to do is to, you know, corral the group, create sharp boundaries, and put outside of those boundaries people who don't conform. Now you ask the question, who is black? The first chapter of my book is entitled, Who is Black? Now I have to give my editor at Pantheon Books the credit for that chapter because I turned in my manuscript without that chapter. And he called me up and he said, okay, I've, I've, I've read the book, but I think you need to have a chapter, and I think it needs to be called Who is Black? And he said to me, I, the, the reason why is this, he said, Randy, he says, listen, so your book is on the idea of the sellout. Now, for somebody to be called a sellout, you have to, you have to be claiming that somebody is within the group. Well, with respect to black people, who's within the group? So here, the first chapter is about varying conceptions of blackness. The whole idea of you know, who's black, or for that matter, who's white, has changed over time. As a legal matter, it has changed over time. I mean, legal definitions of blackness, legal definitions of whiteness have, have changed. And I give, you know, I give examples of the change. The, one of the people with whom I, whom I focus on in that, in that uh, opening chapter is, again, Barack Obama. When Barack Obama, a couple months ago, was um, uh, interviewed on 60 Minutes, Steve Croft, the interviewer, said to Barack Obama, when did you decide to be black? Uh, and, he, and, he, and he asked that because of Barack Obama's background. Barack Obama's mother is white, white American. His father is black, black African. And Barack Obama responded by saying, I didn't decide to be black, I am black. And he went on to talk about the way in which he faces uh, many of the same sort of casual impediments that other black people face. And he said, you know, it's, it's hard for me to hail a cab too. Now, he, 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 he sort of distanced himself from the idea that he had a decision to make. On this, I think that there actually, I think he did make a, he, he did decide something. There was an aspect of voluntariness in his racial identification. After all, there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who have parents of different races who when you ask them, how do you identify yourself racially? 
there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who say, I am mixed race. There are hundreds of thousands of Americans who say, I am multiracial. Or, and there's some, not that many, but some who might say, I'm mulatto. That's not what Barack Obama said. He said, I am black. That was a decision that he made. I mean, Tiger Woods says he's Cablin Asian. It's a decision. Now, my little hy my hypothesis is that at some level, uh, Barack Obama intuited that it would be a problem for him to say, I decided to be black at such and such a point. Because if you decide to be black, that opens up the possibility that you could decide not to be black. Most black Americans don't think that they have a choice in the matter. And if they are looking at somebody who has made a decision, that conjures up the very anxiety I'm talking about in my book, the anxiety of abandonment. And I think that he wanted to avoid that anxiety and so said, you know, I'm black and I'm, and I'm, I'm black by dint of the way I look and the way that people act toward me. But I, I think those things are true. I think those are elements of his racial identity, but I also think a big element of it is, you know, the question of choice. And for me, I'll just, just say, for me, the question of choice is the decisive matter. In my own view, I think that people should, uh, uh, I, I think that people should be able to f be, in racial terms, who they want to be. And in my view, for instance, if, uh, you know, if a black person says, I want to resign, uh, you know, my attitude is, resign. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Now, if that's the case, then because Justice Thomas has benefited immensely from affirmative action, how is it that you don't think it is so? Yeah. I, d I confront that argument in a couple of pages of my book. One of the, one of the things that people say over and over and over in, in condemning Justice Thomas is, how dare you be against affirmative action? You've benefited from it. Now you're kicking away the ladder on which you've climbed. And so, you know, on top of everything else, you are, you know, you're, 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 you're even worse than just being, you're, you're, just, you're just a really terrible person because you're pulling up the ladder after you. I think that's a bad argument. And here's the reason why I think that's a bad argument. Again, I've already told you, I'm, I'm pro-affirmative action. So I, dis I disagree with Justice Thomas. But I think it's a bad argument to, a, to criticize him on the grounds that he's, you're criticizing him because he's benefited from a program. You're essentially saying that he should be disabled from criticizing a program simply because he's benefited from it. All white people in the United States of America have benefited from various white supremacist policies, like segregation. Justice Hugo Black definitely benefited from white supremacist segregation. Do I hold it against him that he then turned around and repudiated segregation? Just because somebody has benefited from something, if it's a... Just suppose, just suppose, let's just do a little mind experiment. Just suppose we all agreed, just for the sake of argument, that policy X is a bad policy. But Justice Thomas benefited from policy X. Would we say, Justice Thomas, you should be disabled from repudiating this bad policy just because he benefited from it? No. I mean, people, 
Just if, 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 if it's a bad policy, it's a bad policy, and I don't care who's benefited from it. So I don't think that's a good argument. I think what people should say is, Justice Thomas, you say that affirmative action is unconstitutional. For these reasons, you are incorrect. There's nothing in the federal constitution read properly that uh, invalidates uh, affirmative action. Justice Thomas, you say that affirmative action is an unwise policy. Incorrect. Affirmative action is a wise policy for this reason, this reason, this reason. The fact of, you know, him benefiting or not should not, you know, be determinative. I think that that's an ad hominem argument that people should get rid of. Okay, I think that's, I think that's a fair, and, and the, the distinction I would draw has to do with um, uh, the character of the policies that, you know, Jesse Helms was championing versus affirmative action. There are people, listen, I'm, I'm pro-affirmative action, but there are people who have championed, um, uh, black uplift, who have been champions of the advancement of black people, who don't like affirmative action. That's not, you know, there are no champions of uh, gay rights who, uh, you know, view with favor the positions that Jesse Helms was taking taking with respect to gay people. I mean, you know, affirmative action, there's a, there's, there's a degree of, there is, there is room with, let me put it like this, there is room for disagreement, in my view, with respect to affirmative action. Room for disagreement that does not include anti-black feeling. Whereas in my Helms example, there is no room for disagreement that doesn't involve uh, anti If you take the positions that Jesse Helms was advocating, you necessarily were anti-gay. I do not think the same is true with respect to the affirmative action issue. You know, in, 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 in my parents' generation, segregation actually facilitated black solidarity in a way. And, you know, there was no question, you know, black people were going to live in a certain area of the city. There was no, just because you had money, you weren't going to live in certain areas. You could, you know, you could be a well-off black person living in a well-off part of the black community, but you were going to live in the black community. Well, now, you know, I mean, if, if assuming you're bank account can bear the strain, you can live all, you know, you can live wherever your money will take you. Uh, there was a time when, you know, people going to schools, for the most part, didn't have a choice as to the sort, you know, the, the type of school they were going to go to. You were black, you were going to go to this school, this school, this school. These other schools weren't open to you. Well, now they are open. There is more choice. Well, when there's more choice, there is also heightened fear. How will people use their choice? With this choice, will they choose to go over there instead of staying with us? And so this anxiety is going to, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's part of group behavior. And so frankly, if Barack Obama were to become the next president of the United States, would this anxiety that I'm talking about disappear? No, it wouldn't disappear. It would, you know, it would be affected in certain ways because that would be such a momentous thing. But would it disappear? No, it wouldn't disappear. Yes?
Yes. Is the answer to your question? Yes. Um, the, the question was: the question was, um, if it's the case, as I say, that the that a black person getting support, being seen as getting support from whites, triggers this allegation or this this suspicion: is this person a sellout? Doesn't that actually, in an ironic way, give a certain sort of power to whites? And the answer, my response is, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, in, in, and not only does it do that, but it also has, you know, very destructive consequences within black circles. And again, in the Barack Obama campaign, we've seen it, we've seen it very recently. So there's this suspicion out there, and the people who are talking, you know, who are sort of talking up this suspicion, want him very much to, you know, allay their suspicion by doing things. They want him to, you know, I, I mean, I talk with folks, you know, they, I talk with folks who, you know, they they would be happy if he were to, you know, come to a campaign rally, I suppose, dressed in a, you know, red, black, and green jumpsuit. Uh, and, you know, let's, you know, run up the flag of blackness. You know, so that he can sort of signal very, very openly and very clearly and, you know, dramatically that, you know, he's one of us. Well, I mean, I suppose he could do that. And, you know, what would the consequences of that be? Well, the consequences of that, of course, would be to completely annihilate any chance of him being, you know, President of the United States. He's not running to be President of black America, he's running to be President of all of America. And, you know, he is handling himself accordingly, and I think quite properly, but there's some people who want him to handle, who want him to handle himself in a different way in order to, you know, mollify their suspicions. You know, there are some people who are less grounded than him, less assured than him, who actually give in to that. There are youngsters, I've talked with youngsters, who, um, you know, well, gosh, you're really good at this subject. You're really good at this subject. Why don't you take uh, an advanced placement course in this subject. I mean, you're so good in history, you should be taking advanced placement history. You shouldn't just be in the regular history. No, I don't want to do that. Well, why don't you want to do that? Well, you know, people, you know, people think I'm a sell. People think I'm acting white. People think I'm, uh, you know, trying to uh, get away from them. I want to show that, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm with my peeps. And I don't want to do anything that's going to Take me too far away from them. Well, I mean, you know, that's a that's a very consequential thing, and uh, that too is part of this phenomenon. And uh, you know, that is having. I mean, people are studying this. That's you know, sociologists are, are, are studying this, and that is having a real consequence. People say that. That's at one level. I've talked with, I've talked with again the most you know, law students at the most elite institutions, who steer themselves away from pursuing certain things because they think that it will trigger you know, the sellout indictment. And this is having real consequences in people's lives. Others? Yes, sir.
we have a big party about 15 people there. There's probably 40 or 50 kids at the party. And when it was my turn to speak, which is everybody's turn, I asked the kid, who has been told to be more intelligent? Mm -hmm. That's why I came here tonight to tell you. It, 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 was, it was very interesting. It, it was very heart, heartbreaking to hear the kids, they weren't honest about it. These kids are between seven and I'll give you one, and I'll just you know say straight away. I don't have a, I don't have a thoroughly satisfactory response to your very good question. I think it's a, it's a question that I'll think about, and attempt to work on, because in nine months there'll be a paperback edition of this, and. Uh, I always like the paperback edition because the paperback edition you get to write a new introduction. And no, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, I keep notes. I, you know, I, I take notes. And in the paperback edition, I get to, in a sense, respond to people who pose questions or pose objections in forums just like this one. Um, the introductions to the books I've, the paperback editions of the books I've written in the past have essentially been responses to the book tour. Now to answer, but I, but I, will, I will give one thing that I've heard, because your question is a question that a lot of people are asking. And I heard a teacher in a discussion say the following. I heard a teacher say, listen, uh, to the youngster, if somebody says to you that you're acting white by working really hard, by seeking to distinguish yourself, by taking advanced placement. What you should tell the person who says that to you then says that to you is you don't know your black history. You don't know your black history because because the blackest thing you can do, the blackest thing that you can do is seek to learn against the odds. So, you know, what is the, what, what, what is the history of black America? I mean, it, what, the history of black America is the slaves going through it's the history of 70-year-old you know, people who had been slaves all their lives learning to read and write with little children. It's the history of people who, you know, braved the Ku Klux Klan in order to read and write and build schoolhouses. It's the history of, you know, Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley and other people uh, going through all sorts of hell in order to learn and allow others to learn. Now, you know, whether that, whether that will take 
I don't know. But that is what I heard one school teacher say. And you know, looking around the room, I got the sense that at least some of the youngsters who were listening to her got the message. But I think it's a very good question that you ask. And there's a man actually at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Professor Ferguson, um, who was studying this. And that's, that's, that, that, that's at the center of his studies. And I, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to pose it to him because, I mean, he, this, is, this is what he studies. He, he probably has thought about this in a much deeper way and might have some useful things to say on it. So thanks for your question. One last, uh, one last question, okay? Shoot. I would agree with that. The trick is, however, that the young person is being told. I mean, in a way, the, 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 I would agree with that. But, but, but I'm not, you know, but, but, but the, well, the, the, the question was, why wouldn't you tell the young person, you know, follow, follow the, a good example no matter who's the person? I would agree with that. The, tr the trouble is, what counts as a good example? And so, what the what, you know, the, the kid who's being told, don't, you know, take the advanced placement. That kid is being told that taking advanced placement is the bad example, and not taking it is the good example. And so, the thing to do is, I mean, the the, the difficulty here is, you know getting beneath that distorted notion of what's bad and what's good. And the pressures are so powerful at that age. Absolutely. It's more powerful than people know. Yeah. It really is. It's dangerous. Okay, I, I think it's important to know that it's a problem. It does. Well, no, I agree. I'm not, I, I it, agree with that. It, 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 it does, but there is a difference. It does, but there is a difference. It's true. For instance, uh, uh, I think of, for instance, the um, I think of the Tom Cruise movie, All the Right Moves, where Tom Cruise is. Uh, uh, it's in Pittsburgh, and it's all about it's white kids, and so these you know sort of working class white kids are on a football team. Tom Cruise plays a character, and, and they all after the after they graduate, none of the kids goes to college. Tom Cruise is a star player, and he's offered a scholarship. And his fellow teammates, his, his teammates, sabotage his efforts to go to college, or at least they attempt to, because they, fe they, they fear that his going to college will be abandonment. These are white kids. Again, every group faces these things. So I'm not making the claim that this is peculiar to black people, but there is a difference in all the right moves or, you know, in the real life case of the white kids, nobody says to the white kids, um, you're acting black. There's not a racial, no, there's not a racialization with respect to the white kids. They may be told something else, but they're not, they're not, they're not taunted with, you're acting black if you go to college. Whereas the black kids are taunted in a racialized way, you're acting white if you go to college. So there is the phenomena, but with the black kids, there is this racial overlay that is very different. Listen, you all have been very attentive. Thank you very much.